But first to the big story that the world is talking about, the Jerusalem deal. U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel has led to protests and outrage. Leaders from the Arab world have condemned the decision. Protesters are gathering on the streets. Our next report brings you the very latest. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. With those words, U.S. President Donald Trump announced a major shift in American foreign policy. Trump's decision has disrupted the global status quo on Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hailed the U.S. President's decision. We're profoundly grateful for the President for his courageous and just decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to prepare for the opening of the U.S. Embassy here. Like many feared, this decision has sparked unrest and protest in West Asia. Protests broke out in Gaza City. Protesters burned tires on the streets and chanted slogans against the Trump administration. Palestine's president responded with some strong words. These deplorable and unacceptable measures deliberately undermine all peace efforts and proclaims that they are abandoning the role of sponsor of the peace process that they have played over the past decades. Leaders from Hamas term Trump's statements a declaration of war. They are calling for a new Palestinian uprising. The uprising that was launched yesterday will continue today. I want it to continue and expand and strengthen so that the occupation learns. And so Trump realizes that he will regret. I say regret greatly this decision. These calls were followed by anger on the streets of Palestine. Protesters clashed with police in Bethlehem amid fears of bloodshed. It made me very sad and very angry. Uh, and made me really feel the depth of uh, injustice uh, which had been inflicted to the Palestinian rights. Here today we're condemning the, um, the American President Donald Trump decision uh, by declaring Jerusalem as the state of Israel. Right now what are we asking for? We're asking the Palestinian Authority and the President Mahmoud Abbas to stop all the peace negotiations with the Israelis. But for most everyday Israelis, really it's nothing beyond uh, stating the obvious. That Jerusalem is the capital, it's the home of all the major uh, establishments here, the parliament and other uh, government offices. And uh, for many Israelis, they consider it really the eternal capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. On the other hand, for the Palestinians, a totally different story. They consider it a slap in the face and uh, are saying that the Americans really are relinquishing their role here as an honest broker in the conflict. Prime Minister of the um, Palestinian leadership uh, saying that this really is the end of the peace process and are calling for mass demonstrations, raising fears that we could see the same kind of violence we've seen before in the Arab world. Uh, great concern over uh, the Islamic sites in the city. And really, the Americans are out on their own on this in many ways because European nations as well saying it's really, well, it really seems like an unnecessary step that will just inflame tensions further. Um, either way, we're talking about a jolt here to a long simmer in conflict, which in recent years has been on a slow burn and now seems to be entering a new chapter. Your Secretary of State Rex Tillerson defended the administration's decision. He said that the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel reflects the ground realities. The will of the American people. The reality is Israel's government, its uh, courts, its prime minister's office is all in Jerusalem today. So it is just an acknowledgement of what is reality on the ground. As to the move of the embassy, the president has directed me and the State Department to undertake the process to begin an effort to move the embassy. We are not going to be doing that quickly. Uh, we have to acquire a site. We have to develop building plans. We'll have to construct a building. So this is not something that will happen overnight. And joining us this evening in the studio, uh, Ambassador Arun Singh, former Indian ambassador to the United States and to Israel. So one of the best people uh, poised to, to comment on what's happening. Mustafa Barghouti, General Secretary for the Palestinian National Initiative. Uh, Anna Aronaim, uh, she is the military correspondent for Jerusalem Post, joining us from Tel Aviv, and Nicholas Grossman, international re relations professor at the University of Illinois. Good evening to all of you. Anna, since you are in Tel Aviv, let me begin with you. Protests have broken out, and tomorrow is Friday. Is the situation expected to worsen? 
It, uh, it is expected to get worse after uh, Friday prayers. Uh, we have already seen protests around uh, the West Bank and uh, in the Gaza Strip as well. Palestinians are reporting that at least 50 have been injured, mostly by uh, inhalation of tear gas, also by rubber bullets, some by live bullets uh, across the West Bank and in Gaza, and also in, in uh, Jerusalem, the old city. Um. Nicholas, Hamas has called it a declaration of war. Uh, the leader, uh, 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 Mr. Hania, has said that this should be a good enough reason to launch a third intifada. How do you see this playing out? I think Hamas is trying to capitalize on the gift that Trump gave them, where the Palestinians had been working on and off on various unity agreements between Hamas, which controls Gaza and advocates violence, and Fatah, which controls the West Bank and um, has renounced violence. And what this ends up happening is giving a lot of fuel to Hamas's arguments. Hamas not only called for more violence, they also said that all of Jerusalem is ours. So as opposed to the Fatah negotiating position, the Palestinian Authority's negotiating position that says they want East Jerusalem as their capital, Hamas has staked out a maximalist position and I think it's likely that they try to gain against their Palestinian rival and also against Israel by stoking violence. Ambassador Singh, uh, the world is, as we said, mulling a diplomatic response. The Arab League is meeting on Saturday. The EU, we understand, is looking at pushing for the Palestinian capital in Jerusalem as well. How does this work? Uh, so I think uh, people will be watching how the U.S. step plays out. Because if you see the way the Israeli process has advanced, uh, historically they, uh, they have made an attempt to link up with the dominant power in the world and based on the support of that dominant power, uh, try and move their interests. In fact, the whole process of uh, creation of the State of Israel started when the British uh, Foreign Secretary at the time, Lord Balfour, issued the Balfour Declaration in 1917, saying that it is the wish of the British government that a national home for the Jewish people would be established. Now, that was a unilateral step. But then things started flowing into place after that. Similarly, I think the Israeli expectation would be that now that the U.S. president has taken this step, uh, because the U.S. Congress had earlier said that uh, undivided Jerusalem was the capital of Israel and that mm. the uh, U.S. Embassy should move to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem. That was way back in 1995. Mm. But all U.S. presidents since then uh, did not take that step. And uh, President Trump has taken that step of saying that uh, he recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and that the embassy would move there. Of course, as Secretary Tillerson indicated, the move of the embassy would take some time, so it's not going to be an immediate step. Right. And even in President Trump's uh, comments, he did not recognize, unlike the position of the U.S. Congress or unlike the Israeli position, that all of Jerusalem would mm. be the capital of Israel. But he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and said the final uh, borders and the final sovereignty uh, that Israel would be have would be worked out through negotiations. So he did enter that caveat. Mm. And now, uh, so if the Europeans uh, say that uh, uh, East Jerusalem should be established as the capital of, uh, of a Palestinian entity or state, but we have to understand that that area is under control of Israel. So physically, mm. it's not really a possibility. And as several people have indicated, whatever be the formal position, uh, the reality is that the Israeli state operates from Jerusalem. That's where the president is, prime minister is, uh, the so parliament said, is. A reflection of the ground reality. That's, yeah. that's what they're saying. Uh, uh, but interesting that you mentioned the caveat, and I want to take this to Anna. Uh, while Donald Trump said that uh, the peace process is very much on and he remains committed to it, uh, many in the White House are saying that they are, quote unquote, prepared for the derailment of the peace process. Uh, what is the... Uh, of the record response uh, of the Israeli establishment, I'm sure they welcome it otherwise, but do they feel that the security challenges outweigh uh, the, the symbolic gains from the shift? Well, there has been a lot of talk in the defense establishment about the danger that, it could, that could come from this type of uh, statement. But the feeling here in Israel on the ground by many Israelis is really that the peace process was dead a long time ago. Uh, and a lot of people also in, in the Palestinian side are saying the same thing. The peace process is dead, and this just is really burying it. Um, so what you have in the 
official defense uh, establishment may be a little bit different from the feelings on the street. And the feelings on the street, at least here in Tel Aviv, I mean, I heard cheering uh, when, when Trump made the announcement. But, you know, right after the announcement was made, people went back to their daily lives and the Israeli news is more concerned about internal politics rather than this statement that Donald Trump made. Uh, Nicholas, uh, many have also questioned that that uh, this this announcement, this positioning, takes away from uh, uh, the the American uh, the American uh, position, if I may, of of an unbiased mediator in the peace process. But the fact is that no one had any doubts about which way the Americans lean when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So has Donald Trump just done away with the hypocrisy? In part, I think that's fair to say, at least a little. But the question is not just which way the Americans lean, but how much they lean in one direction or another. So the United States long argued that support for Israel in part was a way of balancing widespread international support, especially Middle Eastern regional support for the Palestinians. And by taking a more aggressive stance towards supporting Israel, that will undermine the United States credibility among Palestinians, but also among Arabs broadly. So while they knew that the U.S. was leaning Israel, it wasn't as clear before that the U.S. was leaning as much towards the Israeli rights position, uh, towards the position of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Certainly they didn't believe that the previous president, Barack Obama, was leaning that way. And so this is at least a shift that makes it more difficult for the United States to oversee negotiations and to convince both sides that it will weigh their interests fairly. Ambassador Singh, where does this leave the Palestinian cause? And uh, when we say that, we do realize that Palestine is not a monolith. It's a, it's a territory divided between Hamas and Fatah, and uh, they have their own ways and means to respond to this. So I think uh, over time, the advocacy and the situation on the ground uh, related to what you referred to as the Palestinian cause uh, has certainly weakened. First, there has been the division between Hamas and Fatah, with one being dominant in Gaza and the other in the West Bank, and not being able to reconcile uh, their positions. But not only among the Palestinians, if you look at what's happening in the Arab countries, their support uh, for Palestine, the Palestinian issue, Palestinian cause, has perhaps not been as strong as it was earlier. And uh, today, uh, for example, there are problems and differences within the Arab world. Uh, there are differences between Saudi Arabia and UAE on one side and Qatar on the other. A couple of days ago, there was a summit of the GCC where most of the leaders uh, didn't come uh, for that event. So even the Arab countries who are otherwise seen as strong supporters of Palestine and the Palestinian position on demands uh, and their demands, and there was an Arab peace plan of 2002 which had laid down certain markers for advancing the peace process, all of that is not getting uh, articulation and support at this stage. And therefore, if the Palestinians themselves are not in a strong position, uh, there is not much uh, effective Arab support uh, for what they have been articulating, uh, clearly mm, uh, their interests uh, at this stage uh, will not find sufficient advancement. Indeed. I'm going to request you all to stay with us and we're waiting for the Palestinian guests to join. Uh, but uh, we can tell our viewers that this was one of the rare occasions when the U.S. president refrained from tweeting policy. He spoke and stuck to the script on the teleprompter. We on senior foreign editor Padma Rao analyzes the least reported and most important part of the president's announcement. Listen in. Hours ahead of Mr. Trump's announcement last night, Weon offered a prediction that moving the embassy will not mean that the United States, through that move, will recognize Israel's claim on all of Jerusalem's Palestinian-dominated Eastern and Jewish Western sectors as sovereign Israel territory. Sure enough, a section of Mr. Trump's announcement that went largely unnoticed in the frenetic media coverage has proved Weon's prophecy right. In making these announcements, I also want to make one point very clear. This decision is not intended in any way to reflect a departure from our strong commitment to facilitate a lasting peace agreement. We want an agreement that is a great deal for the Israelis and a great deal for the Palestinians. We are not taking a position of any final status issues. 
including the specific boundaries of the Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those questions are up to the parties involved. The United States remains deeply committed to helping facilitate a peace agreement that is acceptable to both sides. I intend to do everything in my power to help forge such an agreement. Mr. Trump could have easily glossed over territorial issues between Israel and Palestine without mentioning Jerusalem. But he mentioned the city's divided status not once, but twice. Without question, Jerusalem is one of the most sensitive issues in those talks. The United States would support a two-state solution if agreed to by both sides. The American president also asked for the status quo at Jerusalem's Muslim and Jewish holy sites, both on the Dome of the Rock, to remain the same for now. This effectively opens up a window of opportunity for the Palestinians to achieve what is core to their demand, East Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. Finally, by leaving the resolution of Jerusalem's disputed status to the Israelis and the Palestinians themselves, and by welcoming the two-state solution in the same breath, Mr. Trump also left an avenue open for the United States, speak the garrulous Mr. Trump himself, to step into that photo opportunity if and when it happens. The Palestinians have gone from not accepting any Jewish state to living as neighbors with one. From daily tensions and economic shortages to a more well-to-do if still part disgruntled society over a span of 30 years. Fundamentalist Palestinian organization Hamas is in the process of shedding its rebel clothing, demilitarizing and acquiring mainstream respectability. And East Jerusalem has always been the most emotional core of their demand. Further and through his slowly and deliberately enunciated passage on the disputed status of the entire city of Jerusalem, side by side with his recognition of Jerusalem, with West remaining the unsaid word, Mr. Trump has subtly positioned himself on the same side as his allies like France and Germany, who have criticized the move. After all, there's hardly a country in the world which has full diplomatic and trade relations with Israel and has not tacitly long recognized Israel's sovereignty over West Jerusalem. If they had not, it would have long been a burning issue in every available international forum. Mr. Trump, the business magnate, born to a humble cloth merchant's family in the working-class Queensboro of New York, is a rank outsider to the honeyed tongues of the Washington, D.C. political elite. For the first time, the United States has a president who is applying management principles to foreign policy and not the posh ones of political science or international relations. Will both the Israelis and Palestinians see it as a now or never chance to settle their issues once and for all? That's a question almost as eternal as the ethereal city of Jerusalem. But the outlook seems positive. Padma Rao, we on. And Ambassador Singh, uh, the question that our viewers in India, I'm sure, would be asking right now. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that others should follow suit. Mm -hmm. America has done it. Is India... Even considering that, should India consider something like this? So I don't know whether India is considering that, but from my perspective, there is at this stage no need to reconsider India's position because the U.S. position on Israel has usually been ahead of the position of most other countries. And on very often when there are resolutions in the U.N. Security Council related to Israel, it's sometimes only the U.S that uh, votes in favor of Israel and most of the other countries vo uh, vote the other way. So that's a position that U.S. takes. Uh, for example, in 2004 April, President Bush had written a letter to the then Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, mm. basically saying that the U.S. position was that large Israeli population centers that were created in the area that had been uh, under Israel's control after 1967 would remain with Israel in any future settlement. Now, that's a U.S. position. No other country has no, taken that position. I don't want to position. compare India's... Uh, India's developed or, or established diplomatic uh, ties only, what, 25 years back. Sure. So yeah. uh, there is no comparison, but uh, the Israelis have always maintained that they were treated like a mistress by India. And now the relationship has come out in the open. And uh, when the Indian establishment also says that we've dropped the hypocrisy, these are two different entities and we'll deal with Israel as a strategic partner, would it help 
to make this move? So I'm not sure it really helps because you've already built a very strong relationship uh, with Israel and recognizing or not recognizing specifically Jerusalem uh, as the capital will neither slow down and advance the kind of cooperation you're building. And the fact remains that uh, there is an implicit sort of acknowledgement that the Israeli capital is located in Jerusalem by everyone mm. because that's where, as I said earlier and others have mentioned, that the president, the prime minister, the parliament, the government offices are there. Indeed. So everybody goes for meetings there. The only precaution that uh, many countries uh, take is that they go for meetings in West Jerusalem mm. and if there is a particularly uh, sort of entity located in East Jerusalem, they don't go there because that is seen as territory not legitimately with Israel. But uh, meetings with the government in West Jerusalem is something that everyone does, Europeans do, uh, we do, and I think all, most other countries do. Right, I must take a break, Nicholas. Very quickly, I want to ask you, do you see any other country in the world at this point considering such a move? No. Okay. No, I, I think that's very unlikely. Okay. If I can come that yeah, it's yeah. not in their strategic interest. Sure, sure. You want to make but I just wanted to add that, that from time to time, several countries have opened embassies in Jerusalem and then they came under pressure from other countries, including Arab countries, and then they shut their embassies and moved out. Mm. So I think what the American move might do, mm. that countries who are inclined to more formally recognize Jerusalem as the capital and move their embassies, especially from Latin America, might be encouraged to also take that step Indeed. over a period of time. Right, right. And the, many countries have diplomatic presence, but not embassies, so to speak. I'm mm. going to thank you all. Arun Singh, uh, Mustafa Barghouti, who unfortunately couldn't join us here on the discussion, Anna and Nicholas, thank you very much for joining us.